You're just talking. <laughs> All right, right, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, Lord, tonight we want to thank you for being in our presence. Lord, thank you that you're sending your Holy Spirit. As we begin the Sabbath, Lord, we want to do it in your word. And this important topic of the plague, so that we know, Lord, what you have planned for this earth and for this world. We just pray, Lord, that we will continue to walk in your way and in your will, and that you will guide us every step of the way. You do nothing in secret, Lord, and so tonight we ask that you reveal to us your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, <clears throat> tonight is the seven last plagues. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're going to be in Revelation 15, 1, um, and then we'll be um, through a lot of the 16th chapter as well. So as we look at Revelation 14, it concludes with the great gathering of the two harvests. God's people were the what? Do we remember? God's people were the wheat. Uh, who was the others? The tares. Yeah, but it's the wine press, remember? The wine press. The blood was going to come up that, I don't know, the length of Palestine. So we have we have the two the two the two groups. Matthew 13, 30 says, Let both grow together and together until the harvest. In the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together, first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into the barn. Well, the repentant are pictured as grapes to be trodden in the winepress of God's wrath. Chapters 15 and 16 build upon this scene that the victorious saints are gathered before God's throne. Revelation 15, 1 through 4, and the rebellious ones are trodden in the winepress of God's wrath in 15, 5 through 16, 21. And we're going to get into this more deeply. What I wanted to do, though, is I'm kind of visual, and so <clears throat> I kind of want to walk through what we've studied so far up to this point. Remember 1798, and what happened in 1798? The Pope was taken captive. Yeah. That and yeah. the, wasn't the French Revolution also then? The what? French Revolution. French Revolution. Mm -hmm. And so between 1798 and this happened, there was a time period, and through that time period, there was some new knowledge that came out of, came out about. And what was that? That happened in what? 1844. And during that time, we, we we studied this. During that time, something began. The what? investigative judgment. The judgment began. And it began with the death in, in Christ. Yeah, it began with the death in Christ. So we have gone through this whole period of time now where we've studied the beast, who that is, what happens to the beast. We studied God's people coming together in, in Revelation 10, remember? Revelation 10. And then <clears throat> Victor did 13, which was the beast. And then last night we did God's people, or last Friday night we did Revelation 14, and Revelation 14 was about what? The three angels' messages. Yeah, so the three angels' messages. So on our timeline in the Bible, we are now up to here. And remember, we, when we see this, we see God's people standing, and we're going we're gonna to be reading that. We talked about that last week, too. God's people were who? The 144,000. 144, so this means that that group has, it is God's people. So God now has his people, and he has the people who worship the beast. And so tonight, we're starting right here, where the time is up, and, oh, that scared me. So anyway, we're looking at what happens after probation closes. And when that time period comes, the, 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 the plagues will fall. And we're going to see who those plagues fall on tonight. Right. So I wanted to get you, catch you up 
sometimes t for me it's easy to see something in a graph and visually rather than just on or reading on and on the page. So let's begin by reading Revelation 15, 1 through 8. So we're introducing the scene, seven angels appear, each with a bowl filled with the seven plagues to be poured upon rebellious humanity. However, before they pour out the plagues, the chapter provides some vital information regarding the meaning and the timing of the plagues. Can I get somebody to read Revelation 15, 1 through 8? I know. Okay. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. So, well, hang on just a second. So if it's the wrath of God, who is this being poured out on? On the rebellious, on the rebellious. That the rebellious are God's, uh, on the wicked. God wouldn't pour out his wrath on his people. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name standing on the sea of glass, holding hearts of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, and for all the nations will come and worship you for you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After these things I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels who had the seven days came out of the temple, clothed in linen, clean and bright, girded around their chest with golden sashes. Then one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels the seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. And we're going to talk about that, but just real quickly, if there's smoke in the temple, we're going to study what that means, but take a wild guess. What does that mean if there's smoke in the temple? There's fire. But if there's smoke in the temple, what's, ha what's going on in the temple? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. That means God is through interceding for man. Yes. So, so we're going to talk about that, and we're going to see how that, that, um, that plays out. So the timing of the seven last plagues in Revelation 16, 1 through 11, tells us that the last plagues are reserved exclusively for those who rejected God and received the, the mark of the beast. At this point in time, there's only truly going to be two camps. And now in our lives, <clears throat> sometimes we bounce back and forth between God's side and not so much on God's side. But at this point in time, Everybody has made a decision. They're either for God or they're against God. And, and I just want to make sure that we understand that as we go into the place. So who wants to read for me Revelation 16, 1 through 11? I'll read it. And so it says, verse 16, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways, pour out the the vials, of, the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea. And it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains and waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and, and wast and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy 
just judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. Verse 10, And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they uh, gnawed their, their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. So these plagues get more severe as they go, don't they? Right. Mm -hmm. They get they get stronger and they get they they get more um, lethal in scope. So these plagues are specified as the last. They are last because they follow the seven trumpet plagues. The trumpets are primarily judgments, anticipating more severe judgment plagues to come, yet to come. Although there are similarities in the language between the trumpets and the plagues and the last plagues, the two series are not the same. There's some, there are some, some significant differences. So first, during the trumpet plagues, the gospel is preached throughout the world. Revelation 10, 8 through 11 says, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go, take the little book upon which, which is upon the hand of the angel which standeth on the sea and upon the earth. You remember who that angel was? Who does that angel represent, that messenger? Okay, we'll give you a little more. And the, and the third angel followed them, saying, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive the mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. He is, shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smart of their torment shall ascend up forever and ever, and they shall have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. We want to remember this part. Here are they who keep what? The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And the faith of Jesus. Not faith in Jesus, the faith of Jesus. Where are you? Are you on page four? Yeah, you kind of skipped. Okay. What did I do? You, you, you skipped the... Uh, you're now in Revelation 14. So. I missed page 4. Oh, you skipped page 3. Yeah. Yeah, page 3. So we... You were, you were talking about Revelation 10, 8 to 11. And Sorry, and then I jumped to another. Okay, no worries. Okay. It happens. My, 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 my thing did not quite print correctly. Okay. So, let's go back to Revelation where it's like 16, 1 to 11. Uh, you read the second that starts with first. Okay, we're on page four. And I went unto the angel and said to him, the top of page four, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it and eat it, and it shall make you bitter in the belly, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the hand of the angel and ate it up, and it was sweet, it was my, in my mouth sweet as honey. As soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said to me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples, nations, and times. This is talking about the 1844 message, where they thought Christ was going to be coming, and when he didn't come, it was very bitter to them. Where are we? We don't know. Yeah. It's helpful if we can know where you're going. Page 3. Where are we? We are uh, Revelation 10, 8 through 11. Um, Revelation 10, 8 through 11. So it's page 3. Middle of page 3. It's your page 3. It's my page 4. Yes, yes, I see. Ah. Therein lies the problem. Therein lies the problem. Okay. 
Okay, now we're going to go to Revelation 8, 3 through 5. Are we all there? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> and another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given to him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints, upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire off, off the altar and cast it to earth. And there were voices and thunderings, lightnings, and earthquake. However, the last plagues are poured out after preaching the, of the gospel is finished and the intercession in the heavenly sanctuary is concluded. The book clearly shows, now we'll read Revelation 14, 6-13. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach the, the, to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, and tongue of people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then we see the third angel following, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive the mark in his forehead or his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment shall ascend up forever and ever, and they shall have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Unto me, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. So we see that special blessing. So that's the first difference between the the trumpets and the plagues. <clears throat> Second, Revelation 5. So, so this section was the, the trumpets, right? It's the difference between yeah. the trumpets and the plagues. So these are the plagues. plagues. This section is the plagues, but it compares it with trumpets. Yeah. Second, Revelation 15, 8 illustrates that the temple in heaven became filled with smoke mm -hmm. from the glory of God and from his power, right. and no one was able to enter the temple. Why is that significant? Because intercession has ended. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The language is derived from both the dedication of the temple in the wilderness and during Israel's exodus. So let's look at Exodus 40, 34, and 35. Then a cloud covered the tent up of the congregation. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able enter, to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. <clears throat> so they couldn't do the work of intercession. Moses couldn't because the temple was filled with smoke. We see the same thing in King Solomon's temple. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because the cloud of the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. <clears throat> so we see here a second time. So when the smoke fills, fills the temple in heaven, we can, we can surmise from these scriptures that <clears throat> intercession is not taking place. On both occasions, the cloud of God's glory filled the building so the priest could not enter to minister before God. With the absence of the priest, there is no intercession in the temple. Revelation 15.8 reflects this idea, telling us that before the seven plagues are poured out on rebellious humanity, Christ's mediatory ministry in heaven will be concluded. The door of opportunity will ultimately close, and the destiny of every person is, <coughs> will be decided. And that we see in Revelation 14, 14 through 20. But before we read that, um, we just want to realize that this is also the time in Daniel 12, 1, where Daniel stands up 
And, and Christ says, let him who is we holy be holy, and let him who is filthy be filthy. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is this point in time. Who wants to read for me? Revelation 14, 14 through 20. I will. <clears throat> and I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap. For the time has come for thee to reap, and the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was wheat. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are full, fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city and blood came out of the winepress even onto the horse's bridles by the space of 8,600 furlongs. Okay, so we see here this, this concept of the righteous and the wicked and, and how when the reaping comes, there's a different reward for each. So the third trumpet plagues are restricted in scope. So the third, the trumpet plagues are restricted in scope and effect. They affect only a part of Satan's kingdom. A phase or a third part is consistently repeated in the text. So we're going to see here in, in Revelation 8 this concept of a third part. And a third part means what? When they talk about a third part. Well, the, the, the Satan's angels were a third part. But it's really meaning just a portion. Mm -hmm. It's not the whole thing. It's, it's a portion is what they're talking about. That's exactly. It's not 33.3%. Uh, no. It's, it's a portion. Exactly. And that's the terminology used for a portion. Who wants to read Revelation 8, 7 through 12? I'll read it. So the first angel sounded, and they followed ale and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of trees was burned up, and all green grass was burned up. I, I, I want you guys to notice how many times they use a third part here. Okay. Keep going, Richard. All right, verse 8. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea, and that life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of water. Verse 11. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became wormwood. And many men died in the waters because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the days shone not for the third part of it, and the night light died. And then, yeah. In Revelation 9, 15, and 18, it says, is it relating to the third part of the angels that fell from heaven, so therefore a third part of the earth is destroyed, it sounds like? Well, when you talk, when, you, when we talk about a third part, it really just means a portion. And that portion can be, if you, when, when you talk about the, the angels falling from heaven, Ellen White says it was closer to half. So the third part is just the portion that God chooses for that time. It's not the entire, it's not in its entirety, but it's a portion of it. And, and Barbara, the, the, <laughs> you know, there is a link between a message and a warning, a trumpet, 
and the play, the execution thereof. Mm -hmm. And when we were doing the, the, the trumpets, we spoke about thirds as well. So there is this link. Now this is the execution of the thirds, which is a part of it. Yeah. It's a portion of it. So, no restriction is linked to the seven plagues. They are evidently global in scope. Note the statement, every living creature in the sea died. So that will be that that's a big that's a big portion, right? Every living creature in the sea died. Lastly, the seven trumpets cover a long span of history from the first century until the second coming of Christ. Correct. Relatively long periods are linked to them. Revelation 9, 5, and 15. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was the torment of scorpions, when he striketh a man. And four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men. But the court which was without of the, te of the temple leave out, and measure them not. So when we're talking about measuring, it's talking about judgment. judgment. Yes. <clears throat> Where it is given to the Gentiles. So that means God's people are judged first. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And after the twenty-three hundred days and a half and a half, the spirit of life from God entered them, and they stood upon their feet in great filth fell upon them which saw them. So however, no prophetic time is specified regarding the seven plagues. The plagues affect humanity at the end of history for a rel relatively short period prior to the second coming. Actually, the seven plagues occur within seven trumpet time frame and the seven, with the seven trumpet time frame. So if we look at the, it's hard to see on the screen, but if you see this, <clears throat> this the first six trumpets, we see intercession and preaching of the gospel is in progress. Correct. But when the plagues, the seventh trumpet sounds, the seventh plagues hit, and there's no longer intercession going on. Can I ask a question? <clears throat> yeah. And, uh, now, uh, when you said it previous, I think it's page four, when you say that about the judgment, when is it Jesus interfere us to the Father? I mean, I know he's in the most holy place right now, right? What he does now mm -hmm. is like judging the dead. Is that, am I correct? It's judging the righteous. The righteous right now? So if, uh, is, when is it Jesus interfere me to the Father? And the cross. The well, he's interceding for us. Uh, interceding. Yes. Yeah, he's he's he's, he's doing. yeah he's pleading our case right before now? the Father. Yep. Yep. There's a time where the righteous are judged first, mm -hmm. and it's the righteous dead who are judged first. Correct. The righteous living are judged last. We do not know when the time frame will begin from the dead to the living. In the meantime, Christ until we're sealed in our forehead, Christ's ministry for in heaven, his interceding with us uh, to remove our sins and pleading our case before the Father will go on until the time when he says, okay, those who are righteous, you stay righteous. Those who are wicked, you stay wicked. And so Christ will be in that temple interceding for us until that moment in time comes. Or we die. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, I so, have a question on the sealing. Because I, I, I understand it in terms of the context of those who are living in the very last days when Christ comes and they remain alive to see him come. But in, in, in my way of thinking, everyone who is righteous that lived hundreds of years ago and went to their death, they were sealed before they died because without being sealed in Christ, then you're on the other side. That's how I think about it. So I know there's a, a seal that's put, put on the living, that are living when Christ comes in those last days, but 
everybody in their lifetime faces a decision, and if that's their probationary period, and God is either giving him them the Holy Spirit and sealing them for His kingdom, or they are they are um, they are rebelling against that and choosing to go in the other direction. That that's the way I think of it. Is that correct? Is that's a little different than I look at. Isn't the sealing <coughs> happening after eighteen forty four? The sealing, yes, but you can't seal. You can't seal somebody who's already dead. They've already made yeah. their decision. So when they went to the grave, they the decision is done. Like their their decision no is done. But God's uh, reviewing starts in eighteen forty four. So as he's doing the process, he is sealing <coughs> people. It's not that their decision hasn't already been done. Is that the sealing is an action of God? That's how I read it, and it's happening. But the, the sealing is a, the sealing is a deposit of the Holy Spirit, so that had to happen while they were alive. Well, the, the, so he looks at the books, and they do the investigative judgment, <laughs> and they put pardon beside that person. But they would have to have made the decision. They should have received the Holy Spirit before they yes, died. That I agree with, because. Once, once you die, there's no, there's no opportunity to change your fate. That yet. is correct. Yeah. Yeah. So when you die, for all intents and purposes, your fate is, 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 is sealed. 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 Yeah. However, the judgment process. That's, I was going to say that. The judgment process didn't begin until 1844. That's the point. So that's when God goes. But you can't put a seal on like dead people. No. What do you right, say? So that, that, the the sealing, sealing is only is, of the living. The, yeah, the sealing is for yeah. the living. I mean, the, the dead have already made their decision, <laughs> that so in right. that sense, they're sealed for one way or the other. Yeah. But the sealing is only occurring for the living. That, that's right. what's being discussed for those at the end of time who are alive when Christ right. comes. Because yes. there's a, a group that is for Christ, and they receive the outpouring of the latter rain. Right. And there is a group that is against, right. and there's no in between. That's right. complete division. We, yeah. we we also need to look look at this very much in line with what took place at at a sanctuary. Mm -hmm. So you came in, and uh, you um, you you offered a sacrifice on your behalf, and uh, and there was a redemption through that particular sacrifice, mm -hmm. and that. For the most stayed in the holy place mm -hmm. once a year that was cleansed yes. through the anointing in the most holy place yeah christ only entered the most holy place in 1844 this is correct so until 1844 all this stayed in the holy place yes. right so it is a ceiling of faith which is confirmed once in the most holy place, God <laughs> says, saved, yeah. not saved. And, and remember, so, if there was sin in the camp, yes. yeah, that was a problem for, the, for right. the high priest, yeah, and it was also a, a problem for the person who had sinned. Right. That's why Jesus do now in the, in, in the <coughs> most holy place, the judgment, Yes, yes that's, where he, that's where he is. Yeah. He's, he's doing two things in the most holy place right, right now. Mm -hmm. He is judging yep. the righteous. Because remember, um, judgment begins at where? House. The house of the Lord. Correct. So he's judging the righteous now because judgment begins at the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. That's one of his that's one of the, his activities right now. Mm -hmm. The other is he's still interceding for us who are living. Correct. And so he's, we can still be connected with him. We, we just this week it was interesting. We did we did a really good study of John 17, and I, I I recommend that you all read that study if you haven't, because it really talks about unity with Christ, how Christ was one with the Father, and how we can be one with Christ, and that's that's the desire that we have or we should have. And that is the desire that Christ has for all of us, is that we come into this oneness and unity with Christ. So, but if I die tomorrow, uh, my judgment will be processed. <clears throat> that's my mind. No, the, that's my judgment. 
will be processed. Your, your judgment will be processed. Um, it will be processed at the close of the probation. Yeah. And you will hear the result. In the yeah. You either are raised up or you're not. Just because you die doesn't mean your judgment is processed right. at that moment. Not at the moment. I know it's probably like a uh, hundred years after, you know, or before, but that's when it's going to be, well, I guess, I don't know if it matters. Yeah, once we're gone, it's, we're sleeping. We just wait for him to wake us up. Okay, let's keep going. The Battle of Jericho in Joshua 6 is illustrative of uh, this point at the trumpet place. The Israelites marched around the city for how many days? Six days. Six days. And what did they do on the seventh? March seven, seven times. They, they, they did. They went out. They marched seven times. So this this is really kind of symbolic of this whole trumpet flag thing. Because at, during the seventh trumpet, the seven flags fall. Just as with Jericho, the seventh day, they marched around the city. What happened? Correct. They blew the trumpets. And the walls came down. And they, well, there's one more other thing they did. They shouted. They shouted. Mm -hmm. Remember? They shouted right. victory. And the walls came tumbling right. down. Right. This event best illustrates the relationship between the trumpets and the seals. The seven last plagues are part of the seventh trumpet. Seventh trumpet. They are poured out as God's response to the anger of the nations. Revelation 11, 18 says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. See, we're talking here about when the, 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 the dead are judged. And that thou shouldst give reward to thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. The seventh plague, <coughs> the seventh plague causes the collapse of the Babylon the Great. Revelation 16, 17 through 21 says, And the seventh angel poured his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. Isn't that like a great shout? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, and, and the great city was divided into three parts. Again, that's divided into portions. Right. And the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of her wrath. And every island fled, fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fall upon men great hail out of heaven, every stone the weight of a talent. And God, and blasphemed God, because of the great plague of the hail, and the plague there, thereof was exceedingly great. So we're going to get into more that the, the hail plague more next week, but we see through this that when God comes, it is coming, it is preparing um, a, a great change on this earth, on the face of this earth. So we're now we're going to talk about the fullness of God's wrath. The seven last plagues are identified as the last because in them God's wrath is completed. Revelation 14, 9 and 10 shows that the plagues were manifest the fullness of God's wrath. And we've read this. So basically, if any man worships the beast through his image and receives that mark, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. What does it mean to be poured out without mixture? Not to do that. All force. Force. There's no mercy in it. No mercy. Absolutely. There's absolutely no mercy in it. It's full strength. There's no mercy. When you... <clears throat> in the, the plagues... Back in Egypt, there was mercy because they said, okay, enough's enough. And they would, they would go to Pharaoh and he'd say, okay, and the plagues would go away. So God showed much more mercy than he's going to show with these plagues. 
and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. So those who worship the beast in its image and receive the mark of the beast on their forehead or right hand have to drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is full strength in his anger. Revelation 14.10 Up until now, God's wrath has always been mixed with mercy. His judgments were always designed to bring sinners to repentance. But now the time has come for all those who have spurned God's grace to experience the fullness of divine wrath. In the Bible, divine wrath is defined as God's reaction to the choices people make. When people turn away from God, it gives them over to their choice. Romans 1, 26-28 says, For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even the women did not change the natural use that unto which that unto that which is against nature. Even women did change. He what? Even women did change. Even women did change the natural use into yeah. that which is against nature. And likewise also the man, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemingly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which were not convenient. So it says, it goes on to say, yet yeah, Sounds like there's going to be some plagues on the LGBT community. <laughs> well, I don't want to go there. Let's keep going. Let's stay in our lesson. We don't want to get off. We don't want to get off on that. We don't. We don't want to get off on that. Let's let's stick. Let's stick with the plagues. We're going to leave that to God. Okay. Yeah. Yet He never gives up on them. His grace is at work to win them back. The Bible is replete in such cases. As stated earlier, the seven last plagues are last because they are preceded by the seven trumpet plagues, representing God's judgment on his pe people's oppressions. Although punitive in purpose, the trumpet plagues were diluted with mercy. They were intended to wake up the rebellious humanity and bring sin sinners to repentance. The, these judgments are executed while the gospel is preached to each those people, to reach those people under divine judgment and to bring them to God. But the seven last plagues are pictured as an expression of God's wrath with its undiluted fullness. They, do not, they are not intended to bring anyone to repentance because the opportunity for repentance has passed and the preaching of the gospel is concluded. And we see that in Revelation 14. The pre-Adventist judgment, the pre-Advent judgment is finished and intercession in heaven is no longer available. And, and the reality is, Barbara, that a lot of those that will experience the plagues, meaning those that have not accepted Christ, will be destroyed and they will die. Yeah. They will not see the Lord come. Well, and we also well, see in this uh, another piece that we're going to talk about a little bit more later, but once everyone's fate is sealed. Right. Those who are righteous, righteous. Those who are wicked, wicked. The Holy Spirit isn't working on them anymore. Correct. That's it. So instead of coming to repentance and being able to come to repentance with the help of this Holy Spirit, they just get angrier. Yes. And angrier and angrier. And so we see those, them, them getting ang even angrier, not just with God, but with God's children as well. So the purpose of the plagues. What then is the purpose of the seven last plagues? First, what, first they are redemptive. Just as God sent plagues to Egypt to deliver his people and to take them to the promised land, so here God sends the seven last split plagues to defeat his enemies and to deliver his people, those who want to destroy them, in addition, these plagues are to bring his people to his kingdom. So when it talks about re being redemptive, it's not redemptive for the wicked, but it's redemptive for God's people because he's coming to get them. Secondly, the seven last plagues are punitive. 
Revelation 15, 1 says, I saw another sign in heaven, and great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them they are filled with the wrath of God. Revelation 16, 2, And the first went and poured his vial on the earth, and there was a noisome and grievous sore upon men. which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. They fall on those who choose to follow the satanic trinity Amen. and harm God's people. Now these people will experience the righteous judgments of God. Revelation 6, 9 through 11, the martyred saints are pictured crying out for vindication. Somebody like to read that for me. <clears throat> And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Verse 10. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Verse 11. And White robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So we see here, as all of us I think have sometimes come to the point, Lord, how much longer are you going to let this go on? I know I've had that, that thought many times. I'm sure you have, all have too. Their cry is representative of the perennial plea of all God's suffering people throughout history. God told them to wait for a while. The partial answer of their prayers came with the seven trumpet judgments. Now when the pouring out of the seven last plagues, plagues their prayers are ultimately answered and God's people are vindicated. So thirdly, the seven last plagues are intended to bring rebellious humanity to the realization of the consequences of their own choices and actions. In Revelation 13, <coughs> excuse me, the people of the world have chosen to follow Babylon. The, same, the satanic trinity which seduced them with false promises and hope. As God withdraws his protection from the world, portrayed the symbol of releasing the destructive winds. Revelation 7:17, 7, and after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, earth holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. The seven last plagues are poured out upon the earth with a devastating effect. Now the people are forced to consider the consequences of their choices. Yet they do not repent. This brings us to our final point. Like the Egyptian plagues, the seven last plagues are intended to disclose the hardness of the hearts of those who rejected the gospel and who chose to side with the satanic trinity. Somebody want to read Exodus 7, 1 through 5 for me? Thou shalt speak all that I command thee. And Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he shall send the children of Israel out of this land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that I may lay my hand upon Egypt, and bring forth mine armies, and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt, by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. So we see, how many times did Pharaoh harden his heart? At least okay. ten. At least ten times, didn't he? <laughs> and he hardened his heart throughout. Well, actually it was that's eleven, because then, then he went afterwards. That's, a, that's exactly it. All the way. All the way. And sometimes God hardened his heart. Yes. yes, and that's what the Bible said. Yes. Said to Moses, yes. "You don't worry. I will harden his heart." That's right. <laughs> See, and, and when, when, God, when God says that, I don't think He literally hardened His heart. I think He allowed Him 
to go his own way. I think, in my view, when it says he hardened his heart, it just means basically he revealed the hardness of his heart mm -hmm. by give, bringing greater and greater light, just like Jesus did with the, the leading um, Pharisees and religious leaders of his time. By showing greater and greater miracles, it showed how they were willing to directly fight God. Because when he resurrected Lazarus, in my, in my view, that put the seal of God on his ministry, because no human being can go up to another human being who's dead and say, hey, come up, at least not without the power of God. And so if God was helping Christ, then he was putting his seal on Christ's ministry. Yeah. But the problem with, the, problem with uh, the, the king of Egypt, the pharaoh, was that he said, basically, who is this God that I should worship him? Mm -hmm. So he didn't believe in the God of the Israelites at all. Mm -hmm. He had his own gods. And so it was easy for his heart to be hardened against mm -hmm. something. It's easier to harden your heart against something you don't believe in. Mm -hmm. But he should have known because... <laughs> I'm sure the Egyptians had records going back to the time of Joseph and how Joseph helped the land of Egypt to avoid the seven years of famine. So I think had he wanted to, the information was available to him. Yeah. I think, though, it's easy. If, if, you, if you look at, at the story of, of the Israelites, you would have a really good king and his son would be just as evil. And so things change from generation to generation very, very quickly. And they often forget history or choose not to look at history. So back to our, <coughs> our lesson. Well, did, didn't we in our country, in this country, America, have good founders that were land-like, but yet our country will yet speak like a dragon? Mm -hmm. Yep, through its legislation. So there's no second chance, and this is really important because there are a lot of second chance beliefs out there within the Christian world. Like the left behind kinds of things. They have willingly chosen to follow the satanic trinity and receive the mark of the beast in spite of God's clear warning. And we've read Revelation 14, 9 through 11, so I won't read that again, but... Basically, they're not going to have rest or day, rest day or night, those that worship the beast. As severe as the last plagues are, they do not move these people to repentance. Just as the, each of the Egyptian plagues increased in hardness of hearts of Pharaoh and his officials, each plague coming upon the worshipers of the satanic trinity hardens their hearts into even greater hatred for God and towards his people. And that's where it's going to get really difficult for God's people because they're going to, not only do they, they're going to take that hatred towards God and put it on God's people. In Revelation 16, 9 through 11, men are scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which have power over the plagues, and they <coughs> repented not to give him glory. <clears throat> And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. So when we look at this, we need to look at, is this, is this literal, or is this symbolic? So an important and difficult question arises as to whether the plagues are literal or symbolic. Revelation's language is often symbolic, which means obvious when interpreting the seals and the trumpets, which seems obvious when we look at the seals and trumpets. However, the situation seems different with the seven last plagues. The fact that the first five plagues inflict intense physical pain and suffering, causing people to curse God, shows that these plagues are literal. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> This is affirmed also in Revelation 7.16, which states that the 144,000 will not hunger and thirst anymore, and neither the scorching sun or the heat will again affect them. These are clearly the trials of the seven last plagues, which are literal. Right. And remember, 
the Israelites had to go through the plagues, didn't they? They weren't taken, they weren't taken away from the plagues. However, when, the, when we come to the sixth plague, which leads us to the Battle of Armageddon, the language is obviously symbolic and spiritual. The language of the seventh plague, which talks about the fall of end time Babylon, seems to blend literal and symbolic meaning. That's correct. It's important to remember that the seven last plagues are a prophecy yet to be fulfilled. The true nature will be fully understood when they're fulfilled. I don't think we're going to have, we're not going to know everything until we're in the middle of it. <laughs> Whether literal or figurative, the seven last plagues will expose the importance, the impotence, impotence. impotence of the satanic trinity to help suffering humanity and will vindicate God and his government. So let's now, we're going to move on to the victorious saints. Before the angels pour their plague upon the beast's worshipers, there is an interlude which describes those who choose not to worship the beast and receive its mark as standing on an expanse symbolizing the sea of glass. They are pictured with harps in their hands singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. There is no doubt this group of redeemed is the same one in Revelation 14, 1 through 5. While earlier they show faithfulness to God in contrast to those who rejected the gospel and sided with the satanic trinity, here they are protected by God in contrast to the beast worshippers who experience the seven last plagues' harmful effects. Since the seven last plagues are portrayed similarly to the plagues that struck the Egyptians during the Exodus, <clears throat> the victorious saints are appropriately pictured as the Israelites at the Red Sea, celebrating great victory and praising God for their deliverance. This is not to say that God's people will be in heaven during the outpouring of the seven plagues. They will be on the earth when Jesus comes, and they will be taken to meet Jesus, coming in his power and glory. Who wants to read for me 1 Thessalonians? I will. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we, which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So we see God's promise is that he will, he'll, he will be with us, won't he? Although they are protected from the harmful effects of the plagues, Revelation 7, 16 clearly shows that they will, in a certain measure, suffer hunger, thirst, and scorching heat of the sun during the plagues. But before the plagues are poured out, God's people are assured that he will be close to them during his, this difficult time. He will care for them as much as he cared for Elijah during the famine in Palestine. And I, this is a little bit long, but I think it's worth reading. So is there someone who wants this, who's ready to do a lot of reading? I, I can do it again. Okay. So, and Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherub that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherub that is before Jordan. Okay, so let's stop right there for just a second. What did God do for him? Fed him. Fed him, didn't he? Yeah. The ravens fed him. Yeah. So we can see that this kind of a thing will happen for those during the last plagues. God will make sure bread and water is sure. And, and, and Barbara, this, this is a good example of, of, of what we've just read. Uh, those God's people 
at that particular time, they will feel the deprivation of, um, of that which it, it came so natural to them. But they will be sustained by God. And it's very interesting, That's what the next verse does. tells us how literal he was. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, provide. It says, and the ravens brought him bread and flesh, in other words, meat, right. in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank out the brook. Nine. And it came to pass, after a while, that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belonged to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain me. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of there gathering of sticks. And he called to her, and he said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in the vessel that I may drink. And she was going to fetch it. He called her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it on me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou said, hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me. And after, make for thee and for thy son. Hang on. What kind of faith does this woman have? I mean... I mean, think about it. Trust exactly. him. <laughs> if there was just yeah. enough for you and your child. See, he's fully surrendered. Yeah. But, but there's, there's a couple of points in this. First, God will bring people into our life to help us mm -hmm. when we're in our worst situation. Yeah. He'll bring us animals. He'll bring us food. Think about the manna that he gave to the children of Israel. So we see here that God, God's plan always work out. Go ahead. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the man, of the woman, the mistress of the house fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn? by playing, slaying her son. And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in thy mouth is true. So as we as we look at this this story, we can see that they went through some very difficult crucibles through this. Not only did Elijah, but the woman as well. But it's it's a hope for us and that life is full of crucibles. We studied that in, in um, the last, one of the last court, lesson quarters. But the crucibles, God will get us through. We just have to hang on. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. Is this resurrection of the son similar to when uh, the two witnesses who fled in the wilderness were slain on the streets of uh, what's called, what's it called, Egypt and Sodom, uh, and then they were resurrected. So the two witnesses were the Old and the New Testament. Is there a parallel there? I'm not sure. I've never looked at that that way. Um, have you thought about that, Victor? No, I have, no I, I have never looked at it that way either. I, I don't know that I would uh, 
So I think, I think I think that that was speaking a, of the word resurrection. What what what's the parallel? So if, if that's the type, what's the anti? Oh, I mean, yeah, what's the anti type? I don't know. The way I look at it is this: the the ones that you're talking about, the the slaying of the two witnesses. It's sort of a descriptive and prophetic. But this was not prophetic. This was yeah. a very literal story. I, I think I think the story. After, go ahead. I I think you have to remember two things. One is the story of Elijah is not prophetic. It's not prophetic. It's That's one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but Elijah, um, they remember when Jesus came, they always asked him, "Are you that prophet?" Are you the promised one, which is Elijah, right? right? And so if you look at the story of Elijah and how he did these amazing miracles, I think he could only do by the outpouring of the Spirit of God, called fire down from heaven, raise the dead. There were few prophets, actually, in the Bible that raised the dead, mm -hmm. right? And so the type of prophet to come in the Messiah was symbolic of the great prophets of the old time. And so um, you can look at it that way in terms of the great miracles Christ, the Messiah would do, but not in terms of the prophecy. I, I see it the same way, Elisa. I, I don't see I don't see these um, these miracles well, at least we haven't these before. miracles as anti uh, anti um, prophetic uh, whatever to Jesus' resurrection. I just thought these these are, these are miracles, evidential. These are miracles that strengthen one's faith. These are miracles that glorify God. These are miracles that uh, God intended to 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 have among the people through generations, so that people could understand. And when God talks about resurrection, it really helps. You see how God's That's working on Elijah. Mm -hmm. And Elijah has had to come along with God, you know, work with God. But his faith really fully trusts, like, uh, even though when the sons died, right? And Elijah kind of like, why did you do this to me, God? You know. The, the, the purpose of looking at this story tonight, however, is to really look at how God takes care of us even in the worst kinds of situations. Yeah, number one and number two, just like that, the, 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 the lady, I've got to have enough faith to believe and trust God that he's going to provide and supply. Yeah. That's, that's really So the kind of experience Elijah had with needing to be fed, being in the wilderness, being in the desert, he made sure he had well food, he made sure he had water, is what God will do for us when we're in those kinds of situations. Because at some point that everything's going to break down and trying to get food and water may be very difficult. And our, our, foresight will give us huh? our foresight and preparation is almost impossible. Yeah. In this story, but there is some story that is not even, I mean, even though if our faith is strong enough, like uh, Christian persecution back then, you know, there are people die with the, you know, I mean, but it's still like, you know, the, the eternal life is on them. Well, Elijah was in a horrible situation, if you remember um, his battle with Baal mm -hmm. and the prophets of Baal and how Jezebel would take them out in camps and saw them in two and put them to death and all kinds of things. So I, I did want to say though, I do think every story in the Old Testament has a symbolism to it. So I think there is symbolism <laughs> in each story. And I think maybe we don't understand all of that symbolism. Yeah. And I guess the reason I was equating it with the French Revolution is because they shouted, kill the infamous one, meaning Christ. Crush the wretch. Yeah. Um, l'enfant, I think was it. So, uh, the crushing the wretch, or that means that sort of symbolic killing of Christ by the French Revolution. Okay. Thank you. So now we're going to look at the first five plagues. <clears throat> With the conclusion of Christ's mediatory ministry and the sealing of God's people is concluded, the door of opportunity to switch sides is permanently closed. 
The winds have been held back and are now unleashed to the bow. And the seven last plagues are poured out on the earth. So we have read this, but I want to kind of walk through. In verse 2, so what is the first angel um, pour its bowl on? The on the earth. And what happens? On storms on people, malignant source. Malignant source. The second angel onto the what? The sea. The sea. And it becomes what? And how what dies in the sea? Oh, everything. Every living. Every living thing. The third angel pours his bowl on the what? The rivers, rivers and the springs. And the springs. <clears throat> so that means the drinking water <clears throat> becomes blood. Blood. And then they poured, okay, so on an altar. The fourth angel, what does he pour his on? First sun. The sun. The sun. And men were scorched with fire, weren't they? And the fifth yeah. angel is what? On the throne of the beast. Throne of the beast. And what, what happens on the throne of the beast? His kingdom became darkened. Yeah. And they, they blaspheme God. And they were in pain. They blaspheme God because their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. So a voice from heaven in the temple, the place of intercession, was previously taking place, commands the seven angels pour out their plagues on those who sided with the satanic trinity. The voice from the holy place in the heavenly sanctuary where the prayers of the oppressed saints are offered. And we see in Revelation 8, 4, the smoke of their incense which came with the prayers of the saints right. ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Their prayers are now ultimately answered. The time has come for God to vindicate his faithful people and to bring his righteous judgments upon those who harmed them. So the first angel was now the, uh, on the earth and they had painful and malignant sores. Those who have the mark of the beast. This disease is described as painful, incurable boils covering the entire body. Let's look at Deuteronomy and Job. Would someone like to read those two scriptures? The Lord will smite thee with the watch of Egypt and with the emeralds, hemorrhoids. The emeralds are hemorrhoids, just in case you didn't know. <laughs> yeah. And with the scab and with the itch, whereof thou canst not be healed. The Lord shall smite thee in the knees and in the legs with a sore watch that cannot be healed from the sole of thy foot unto the top of thy head. Job 2? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And then let's and then we see the same thing happening <laughs> to the Egyptians in Exodus. You want to read that one too? Sure. And they took ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses sprinkled it up toward heaven, and it became a boil, breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boil was upon the magicians and upon the Egyptians. Have any of you ever had a boil? If you haven't had a boil, they're not a whole lot of fun. <laughs> they are not. They're very, a boil. They're, they're very, very painful. So the word boil is helkos, which is ulcer or sore. A superating wound. That means it's, it's it can, they can be oozy, they can be, you know, they, they, they get hot, they get red. They get swollen, they're full of, of pus, mm. and they break open. So we see this, this happening. Helkos is used uh, of the boils that befell the Egyptians of a botch, which they could not heal. And the boils also came upon on Job. Again, 
This door vaunted miracle working power of the spirits, how cooperating with apostate Christianity apparently proves unveiling. In Revelation 13, 3 and 13 and 14, it says they do great wonders so that they make fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men and deceive them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. Uh, Revelation 18.2 says, And he cried, Mighty and strong, Babylon the great has fallen, and has become a habitation of devils, and a hold of every foul, clean spirit, uh, unfoul, every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean clean and hateful bird. So we see that these boils go along with all of the, the supernatural kinds of things that are going on on the earth at the same time. And the beast was taken with him and the false prophets that wrought miracles before him, which he de deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These were cast in, alive into the lake of fire and brimstone. And then Revelation 16, 14, there are spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth to the kings of the earth and gather them for battle to that great day of God Almighty. The falsity of the claims that men have, based, have been based on miracle working power is demonstrated in a way that they can't deny. So they're not going to be able to heal these ulcers, all these magicians, because remember, it, if, there's going to be huge, huge miracles and huge, huge supernatural effects that we're going to see before Christ comes. Yes, somebody had their hand up. Well, so uh, Pharaoh's magicians were allowed to a certain degree to counterfeit the miracles that Moses did up to the third plate, but beyond a certain point, they had no more power to keep up with um, the plagues God was coming up with. And the fact that God was directly putting the boils on the magicians themselves kind of showed how powerless they were. And it seems like they, they serve the same purpose here. Yeah. To show how powerless these miracles are against the, the power of God. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and some of what, a lot of what we're going to read, um, the next bit is comes, comes from the um, Bible commentary as well. And it starts on page 138. So we see... <laughs> that the victims of this plague are exclusively those who have the mark of the beast and worship the beast's image. The first plague carries out the threat of the third angel's message. Those who have the mark of the beast and worship the beast and its image must now drink mixed, undiluted God's wrath. God's sealed people are not affected. We've talked about that. The second angel pours his bowl out now on the sea which becomes the blood of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea dies. The third angel then pours his bowl out on the rivers and springs, and all the water immediately turns to blood. Without water to drink, rebellious humanity will not survive. The reason given for these plagues, because they poured the blood of the saints and the prophets, you have given them blood to drink in response a voice comes from the altar saying, Yes, O Lord Almighty, God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. This is the altar of burning, spoken of in the fifth seal, under which God's people pray for God to vindicate them and to judge those who oppress them. Now the voice from the altar affirms that their prayers are finally answered. God is beginning to judge these oppressors. Justice is finally dispensed. When it talks about upon the sea, under the third plague, rivers and fountains of waters, as we see in verse 4, the sea is useful primarily as a highway for international commerce and travel. It has been suggested that by the obstruction of international travel and trade, this plague is designed to demonstrate in a signal way God's displeasure with respect to Satan's plan to bind the nations of earth together under his control. He can compare this to Balaam's experience in, in Numbers 22. And what did Balaam try to do? Of course, the Israelite nation. Mm -hmm. God did not allow it. Yeah. So when we look at the blood, it's, it's doubtless in consistency, color, and odor, but not necessarily in composition of a dead man. 
Nothing more offensive can be imagined than coagulated blood of a dead man. Every living soul or every living thing, the word for soul, push, is used for animal life as well as human life. And we see this in Matthew 10, too. So does somebody want to read uh, Matthew, Psalms, and Revelation here, please? Okay. Matthew 10, 2. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother. Psalm 16, 10. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer in hell. Holy One to see corruption. Revelation 8 9 says, and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. So we see that this Pusha's creature is obviously referring to, and then we see that this push is referring to, to marine life. Yeah. In Genesis 8.18 it says, And God remembered Noah and every thing, living thing, all the cattle that was with him in the ark, and God made a wind to pass over them, and the waters he saw it went away. The Hebrew equivalent, nephesh, living thing, is similarly used of animals. Right. And Job 12.10 says, In those in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of mankind. So, rivers and fountains of water in Bible times, rivers and fountains of water were primarily useful for everyday requirements of drinking, bathing, and irrigation. Whereas the second plague would doubtless result in great inconvenience and, and perhaps the interruption of trouble. Travel. The first, the effects of the third would be immediate and serious. Compare the first plague with that of the land of Egypt. And we look, we see that too in Exodus 17 through 19. And we see that, um, thus saith the Lord, in this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. I will smite the rod in my hand upon the waters in which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. And the fish that is in the river shall die and the river shall stink, and the Egyptians shall loathe to drink the water of the river. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying to Aaron, Take thy rod, and stretch it upon thy hand, and the rivers and waters of Egypt, upon their streams, upon their rivers, and upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood, and that they, there may be blood throughout the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. So like the first and second plague, third plague, these first three plagues are not, are not universal. But think about this, what this blood will do. If everything turns into blood, and, it's, and if you think about blood congeals, you know, you get blood clots, you see this, this thick yuck, and it's going to be hard for them to travel it's going to be hard for them to grow anything. It's actually going to be impossible. Yeah, there's no way it goes. Yeah. So there's a, a lot of devastation yeah. that goes, goes with this. Yeah. So then we go, <coughs> now we're going to the fourth angel. The fourth angel pulls his bowl upon the sun. An intense heat scorches people, causing unbearable pain. The unbearable pain, however, does not move them to repentance. Nothing will make them change their actions. They have hardened their hearts to such an extent that they cannot turn around. <clears throat> Instead, they curse and blaspheme the name of God, who executes these plagues, and they refuse to repent. In doing this, they follow in the footsteps of the beast, who blasphemes God's name. Revelation 13, 6, and they opened their mouth in his mouth and blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell therein. So while the first four plagues affected the population in general, the fifth plague strikes the beast's throne, bringing total darkness to the earth. So before we get to that, I just want to talk about this, 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 this plague of the sun. Why would it be a plague of the sun? Well, if, if 
you if you look at the list of the plagues and what they're targeting, very similar to the plagues of Egypt, they were targeted against the false gods that the people were worshiping. And we see that here as well. The rivers, the waters, the sea, it's the exactly sun, right. the earth, and then the false beast in his kingdom. It's all their false gods. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at the world in general, they're worshiping Gaia, Mother Earth, and then they worship ecology. So they worship the creature rather than the creator himself. So God's going to be like, Okay, well, you guys who are worshiping ecology over me, I'm going to destroy the ecology. Well, all of the pagan gods worship who? The sun god. Yeah, they all, yeah. all of them have a sun god. Mm -hmm. And so they've chosen to worship the sun god mm -hmm. rather than the god of this, of, of this earth. Mm -hmm. So that, that is important. So also, while the fourth plague affected the population in general, the fifth plague strikes the beast's throne, bringing total darkness over the earth. This scene mirrors the ninth plague of Egypt, which struck the whole land with intense darkness. <clears throat> so we see that in Exodus 10, 21 through 23. Would someone like to read that? And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand, thine hand toward the heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be fell. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward the heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwelling. Interesting. That's amazing. Yeah, see how God took care of his children through this, this darkness. It is Satan who delegated the throne of authority to the sea beast. With support of the earth beast, the sea beast exercises authority over the earth, deceiving and coercing the world's people to side with the satanic trinity. But even the seat of Satan's authority cannot withstand the force of the plagues. The authority of the sea beast <laughs> is now undermined, and the beast suffers great humiliation before the people. And the world's people gnaw their tongues with pain and become more en enraged. So why is the, the great beast humiliated when this happens? Because he's also subjected to it. Yeah. And, and no there, is no, because, there is no power coming yeah, out of it. They cannot solve the problem. See, everybody thinks this beast is God on earth. The yeah. emperor <laughs> has no clothes on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, that's a great statement. That's it. Yeah, but who is, this, who is the head of the beast at this point? Would be the Pope. Well, the, the dragon, the dragon oh, is the really yes. U.S. Oh, what, what, what are you talking about? Uh, are you talking okay. About? So, we're the, in the plagues. The beast at this stage is an amalgamation of the beast from the sea with the beast from the earth. But who's at the head of it then? The Satan. Who personates Christ? Satan. Oh, Satan does. I mean, yeah, so that's why I said the dragon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, so that's their God at this point in time. Right. Mm -hmm. And this God has been doing all these wonderful miracles. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, this darkness falls upon his seat. And he can do nothing about it. Yeah. Correct. So he's so they're all looking at him and going, you know, who are you? So that kind of is humiliating to him. As the world's people uh, gnaw their tongues in pain, they become more enraged. They begin to realize the impotence of the unholy Trinity to protect them from the effects of the plague. They feel deceived. However, in the case of the Egyptian Pharaoh, the terror and pain of the plagues increasingly hardened his heart. They have, this, they have set their minds against God. They continue to curse and blaspheme God for their pain and their sores and further refuse to repent. Upon the sun, according to the Greek, uh, the first three plagues, were poured out onto the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters, respectively. 
The next three are for, and this comes from the um, Bible commentary. The, the next three are poured out upon the sun, the beast throne, the river of Euphrates, respectively. The seventh is poured out into the air. <coughs> what distinction, if any, inspiration may have intended is not clear. Power was given, literally. It was given or it was permitted. This scorching men with fire. Um, men with fire. Normally the sun warms and cheers men and controls planet growth, climate, and other natural resources necessary to maintain life upon Earth. Now it sends forth an excess of warmth and energy that tends to torment and destroy life. Though men doubtless <coughs> suffer directly from the intense heat, its worst result are doubtless the most severe drought, famine, the world has ever known. But the literal plague is accompanied by the famine for the word of God. Remember, that famine we see is for the word of God as well. Isn't there an interesting parallel that um, Nebuchadnezzar, when he was trying to punish the three worthies who wouldn't bow to the image, he told them to heat up the furnace seven times. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, now, now God is heating up the sun seven times. Like, take that. <laughs> so let's I'm read. Heat up the sun seven times. <laughs> so let's read Amos eight, eleven, and twelve. All right, let's read. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, uh, not a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north, even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Isn't that amazing? Well, and that, that tells us something, too. Yes. We're not going to be able to depend on a book. No. We're not going to be able to depend on our iPads or our phones at this point in time for the Bible. It has to be here, and it has to be here. When, when this time comes. So throughout the land, there is a feverish but vain quest for a means of alleviating the suffering and want occasioned by the first four plagues and of averting further calamities. It is not motivated by godly sorrow, but by sorrow of the world. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 11. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but ye, that ye sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, and not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Behold, this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a god's sort, what carelessness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things, we have approved ourselves to be clear in this matter. So the objective is to escape the misery occasioned by the plagues, not to enter into a genuine state of reconciliation with God. According to Satan, accordingly, Satan convinces the inhabitants of the earth that they are that not, not that they are sinners, <clears throat> but that they have erred in tolerating God's chosen people. Like the three preceding plagues, this is not universal again. Blaspheme, blaspheme. Here, to to uh, here to blaspheme God is to speak of Him derogatory fashion. Under the fourth plague, men began to blame Him for their misery, and to realize at last. They're fighting against him. The name of God, that is God himself, the name stands for the person who bears it. Matthew 6, 9. In the manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And verse um, 11, and, no, and verse Acts, Acts 3, 16. <laughs> And his name through faith is the name in his name hath made this man strong. Who ye see and know, the faith which is by him hath given him 
this is perfect sound in the presence of you all. So then this, this term repented not. And we, we talked about this, but I just want to go over it one more time. So and instead of acknowledging their guilt, they proceed to lay blame for their miserable plight upon those who remain loyal and true to God. This is so important to remember. Because a lot of times this anger is, be, is to those who remain loyal to God. In utter perversity, they refuse to yield to his will and demonstrate themselves to be what they really are, devoted to servants, devoted servants to Satan. The refusal to repent them to be together and unalterably opposed to God, give him glory, that is, acknowledge him to be, the, be true and righteous. Those suffering from the plagues refuse to admit themselves in the wrong and God in the right, even in the face of severe judgments that would lead honest, contrite men to amend their ways. Who wants to read Isaiah 26, 9 and 10? I'll read that, but first a quick comment. So yeah. I was thinking there was those types of confessions in the Bible, like the one of Judas and of Esau and of Saul that were not genuine repentance. They were more sorrow for the consequences of their sin. Yeah. Because that, uh, with Judas, he did actually tell Jesus, hey, uh, I'm sorry, please please uh, deliver yourself. But Christ is like, no, I came for this reason to the earth, so I'm not going to do that. Well, Judas didn't understand God's mission. He wanted him to set himself up as earthly king, and he thought by doing so... He was pushing his hand. He was pushing his hand. Well, I was going to say, uh, Barbara, yeah, you know, the statement uh, that, you, that you made in, in reference to the repentance, we are seeing that today. Of course, it would be nothing like it. When things are not happening the way the, the multitude wants, Christians are blamed. We're seeing it today. It's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, I think this is obvious. Uh, who is going to be blamed? The people of God. Yeah. That's just the way it is. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll read the verses then. With my soul have I desired thee in the night, yea, with my spirit within me I will seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Let favor be showed to the wicked, yet he will not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness, he will deal unjustly, and he will not behold the majesty of the Lord. You know, we can see going through these plagues, really the hearts of man who don't love God. Mm -hmm. And just think about how miserable they would be in heaven. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So their hearts proved to be utterly hardened and, un and unsusceptible to either divine mercy or uh, severity. So we see in Exodus 4.21, And the Lord said to Moses, When thou goest to return to Egypt, see that thou do all the wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand. But I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. And we see in Ephesians, and the Lord said to Moses, When thou goest, return to Egypt, see that thou do wondrous before Pharaoh, and I will harden his heart and not let my people go. I may have put the same text in there twice. Somebody want to look up quick, quickly while well, we'll come back to it, Ephesians 4.30? Yeah. And the fifth angel said in Revelation, He poured out his vial on the seat of the beast again, and we see that it was full of darkness, and they nod not shoot on their tongues <coughs> because of the pain and blaspheme God because of the pain. Here it says, yeah. Ephesians 4.30 For we are members of no, His no, God. No, no, no. not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed unto oh. the day of redemption. Yeah. So that's what I was talking about earlier. Yeah, Jesus. all of us are sealed. If we are, if we believe in God and we have His Holy Spirit, even though we die, we are still sealed by God. I see what you're saying. Yeah. 
We are sealed by. And that's well, and and that's and and that's the only way we can we we can be vindicated through the judgment. Is it if we're not just sealed in, in God, then we're on the other side. Yeah, our fate is set. Yeah. Yeah. When is the justification happening in your life or sanctification? Like should be moment by moment. Yeah. So if you're on God's side, you're you know, of course you're gonna be sealed by him. So we, we see this this issue of uh, th thronos or thrones in chapter 13. The seat of the beast is apparently the headquarters where the beast represents primarily the papacy in its revived state. Not so much in its, in the, its religious acts, fact, as it is assumed role of world power, but dominant over other world powers. And we're seeing that we're seeing that more clearly today, that power. If you look at, um, especially in the religious world, if, and, and in the climate change, the Pope is taking the lead in, in a lot of this. So, uh, who wants to, we've read 11, Revelation 13. You know, we, we miss the fifth angel, which is Revelation 16, 10 to 11. Which is what you were just referring to when you were talking about the seat. Mm -hmm. Did we need to read that? Go ahead and read it. Um, and the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we see this, this again. We see that. In Revelation, um, in Revelation 13, we've read most of Revelation 13 before, but let's, who wants to read Revelation 13 and then Revelation 17? Okay. Go ahead. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet <clears throat> were as the feet of a bear, <clears throat> and his mouth to the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Read the next one too. Revelation, Revelation 17. So he <clears throat> carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou uh, sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell upon the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of the life from the foundation of the world. Uh, when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. And here's the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. Uh, you mean know the seven mountains? Are, uh, uh -huh. yeah. uh, on which the women sit, and there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other one is yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and go up into perdition. Yeah, so this, this kingdom that he has, when, when all this is taking place, except for a small remnant, they still, it, it still resists his supremacy. Satan's numbers in the, in the world, and his subjects, and it is through the revived papacy in particular that he seeks to secure undisputed control over the entire human race. Mm -hmm. Revelation 9.19 says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And we see that, we, we see that whole, as, as we get more and more into wars in this world, we see them becoming, I mean, we've had world wars in the past, but we see these different wars becoming more global. And we see them breaking out in, in more and different places. 
So it would therefore appear that for the duration of this plague, the entire world is enveloped in a pall of darkness. Yep. Thus, while men grope unrepentedly for light in a spiritually dark world, God sent upon them literal darkness, symbolic of the deep spiritual night that is yet to enshroud the world. The darkness, this entire class, reads literally, his kingdom became darkened. Greek implying that it remained so for a period of time. This literal darkness, with its attendant cold and, and misery, the absence of light and heat, would be all the more impressive and painful after the intense heat experienced by the fourth plague. So you see this major, major contrast. And this gnawing of the, the tongue, they kept biting their tongues out of pain. It is because of pain, possibly an intense cold accompanied uh, tire long, prolonged darkness, entire long and pro prolonged darkness. Men confirmed their perverse hatred of God, their attitude under the fourth plague persists unabated. So we see that <clears throat> through the fourth plague, through the fifth plague, and we kind of mixed with the, the third, fourth, and the fourth, fifth, and fifth plagues as we as we went through this. We kind of went back and forth. But we see that each one of these plagues is symbolic in nature. And that's the symbolism goes back to things that the beast power has done to God's people. So next week, we are going to get into the fifth and sixth the sixth plague. and the seventh. Sixth and seventh plague, thank you. Sixth and seventh plague, and that is the river Euphrates in Armageddon. That's it. And when you look at this, it's it's looked at as a site or time of a final conclusive battle between the forces of good and evil. There is a lot of confusion out there about the sixth and seventh plague. Go ahead. Well, one of my thoughts is that it seemed like God's judgment is vindicated because he's, he's already selected who's going to uh, follow him and who isn't. So by pouring out these flakes, he's essentially revealing what their true character is. He's basically saying no matter how severely I punish them, uh, they're still not going to change, nor, nor what inducements I give them. Because I think he's put forth the most severe punishments he can come up with, and also the most uh, amazing inducements. So for following him, you get eternal life. For following the beast, you get unmixed wrath of God, which sounds pretty horrible. It does. So, um, anyways, I was saying about that, and, and Victor's going to delve into this next week. Yep. Because there's questions about the, the Euphrates and Armageddon as to are they, are they literal, are they spiritual, what, what is really going on with Armageddon. There's a lot of people, in fact I, I had this conversation with a couple of folks uh, not too long ago, they thought Armageddon was the final battle after the thousand years. And so, so we, we're going to look, Victor is, is going to clear us up on all of that. So here they are, ready to turn their anger against God's people. In this way, the world's people become fertile soil for the, for the final deception, which Satan will use to draw the entire world into that great battle between God and Satan. The final deception is portrayed in the sixth plague. So let's just do a little teaser and read Revelation 12, 16, 12 to 16. Go ahead. And blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, and the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. 
and he gathered them together into a place called in Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Armageddon. So that very first word and blasphemed is key to the interpretation of Armageddon. Yeah. Armageddon is not a battle, a physical battle, it is a spiritual battle. So that's so, uh, so we're gonna look at, at that next we, week. We're going to look at that. It's really interesting because all of these movies about the final battles of Earth, somehow the Earth always wins. But that's not quite how the Bible teaches it. All right, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we're thankful that you have, are willing to show us what is to come. And Lord, in that it's not about fear, but it's really about showing your love for your people. You have warned us things will get difficult, but you have promised that you will be with us, that our bread and water will be sure, that even we saw with the Israelites, when the, dark, when the Israelite plagues, when there was darkness, your people still had light. When the wicked were starving, that, that we still have food. So Lord, we're going to claim those promises as we go forth, Amen. that you will walk with us, you will guide us, and you will bring us into your perfect truth, Lord, for it is our desire to be with you in heaven. And whatever you have planned for our lives, Lord, you will walk with us, you will heal us, you will, you will love us, and you will get us through the crucibles. So thank you for hearing our prayer tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you for this chart. I like the chart that you have. That's actually, there's several charts out there and they look a lot alike. Yeah. But I really like this one. And when I've done uh, final event seminars, um, this also has a, um, a book that goes with it yeah. that walks you through the final event.